and um, you will be muted during the duration of the program, though we may have an opportunity for you to unmute at the end to ask questions, but we'll go over that at the very end of the program. I just wanna alert you to a few things in Zoom. Please take a moment to locate the participant and chat function on the Zoom platform that will actively, uh, or allow you to actively participate in the webinar. And if you have any questions, uh, please save them more towards the end of the program since we're gonna be going pretty quickly through multiple presentations. But you can send your questions in the chat box and then um, we'll get to questions at the, end of the, at, the, at the end of these presentations. Though there may be a few moments in between presentations for a question or two. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can email me at stephanie.bilkey at audubon.org or you can send a private chat to me in the chat box. Um, my email address for those of you on the phone is stephanie dot b as in boy, e i l k e at a u d as in david, u b as in boy, o n as in nancy dot o r g. Um, and to get us started with today's program, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Kendrick. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for participating in our telemetry sections uh, session of the Midwest Migration Network Virtual Conference. Um, thanks for taking the time. I'm, again, Sarah Kendrick. I'm the State Ornithologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation, and I'm the initiative lead for the telemetry group for the MMN. So today we have a great lineup of speakers to give you a really broad view of MODIS in the Midwest, followed by a lightning round of folks chiming in with what they're working on and where using MODIS. And then we'll have a question and discussion portion. So this is all very high level. We really view this as kind of a kicking off point for collaborations in the Midwest. So we won't have a thick, rich discussion, but it'll be a good starting point for us. So thank you again to all of our speakers who are here and welcome to all the participants. So first off, uh, before I turn it over to Stu McKenzie, uh, the director of MODIS for kind of an introduction to MODIS, I'd like to do a brief poll of three quick questions to get an idea of where all of you are coming from regarding MODIS in a few different ways. So we'll just take a few seconds per question. So get ready to click your answer. If not all folks are able to answer, it's no biggie. This is just to inform our discussion a little bit at the end and it'll give me something to mull over while the presentations are occurring and give us a little bit of context for what's going on. So I'm going to launch the poll. It says it's in progress. So you go ahead and just click your answers to the three quick questions um, if you don't mind and that will give us an idea of what's going on. It says zero people have voted. I'm hoping it's working. Oh, there's a few. Okay, they're coming in. <laughs> the joys of Zoom. Okay. So we have quite a few people. I don't know why there's writing all over my screen right now. Does anybody know why that's happening? Stephanie, help me. I've never seen that before. <laughs> it's very bizarre. I don't know what's happening and it's okay. It says it might be a Zoom bomb. I don't know what that is. Does anyone know how to fix that? Okay, so it says attendees are now viewing the poll results. So we have about 64% in the Midwest, others outside the Midwest or in Canada. Welcome to everyone. This is not just a Midwest thing. That's how it began, but clearly we need um, collaborations across the hemisphere really. So how familiar are you with MODIS? A lot of folks, I've heard of it and uh, they're here to learn more. So. Um, there are others that have dabbled. I'm working on a project using MODIS. That's great. This is all good. And are you currently working on a project using MODIS um, in the Midwest? 54% uh, no, but there's about 30% yes and about 20% planning on it. So that's great. I'm going to stop sharing those results. Um, so hopefully we are back on the PowerPoint where it won't be ruined. I don't know how that happened. Um, but that's okay. So I'm going to turn this over to Stu McKenzie. I will be running his PowerPoint separately. Um, and he will just let me know um, when he, we are ready to advance. So Stu, I will turn it over to you. Hold on, I have a mini intro here. I just need to get to it. So Stu is the Director of Migration Ecology at Bird Studies Canada. He manages the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System, no small job. 
um, Long Point and Thunder Cape bird observatories and aspects of the Canadian Migration Monitoring Network. Uh, Stu has been using MODIS since before MODIS was a thing. So welcome Stu and go ahead. Uh, great, thank you very much. Sarah, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, hopefully we're scribbleless uh, moving forward, um, but, we'll <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, so Sarah, you can go ahead uh, whenever. Okay. So I'm having some bandwidth issues, so I'm gonna be black uh, to everybody. And um, uh, we're, Sarah's progressing the presentation for me. Um, and hopefully uh, the slide order may be the same, but we'll see how it goes. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm, uh, enthused at the turnout. Um, I don't know how many people are here, but we had over 200 people registered, um, which is really a testament to, to how well we're doing um, building this collaborative network and how much interest there is in the Midwest and elsewhere. So um, intuitively, Sarah, you can feel free to try and guess when I wanna go ahead <laughs> or I'll uh, just say next. Um, so we've covered at length as to why to track animals, um, particularly migratory animals, um, the main point being that their different stages of their life cycle are inextricably linked. So if we're going to conserve them, we need to conserve the whole package. So I'll save my time for a little bit elsewhere and you can go ahead. Now the holy, go ahead there, Sarah. The holy grail for ecologists tracking animals um, is to essentially know everything about all animals um, at all times. And we have many different tools uh, to discover that, um, as some of the other presentations alluded to, GPS and bird banding, satellite tracking, um, and then there's uh, radio telemetry, or in the case of MODIS, automated radio telemetry. Sarah? So MODIS is based on automated radio telemetry and we sort of coined the phrase collaborative or cooperative automated radio telemetry. So currently it provides the smallest available devices, uh, less than or around 0.2 grams to track any um, migratory animal. They come in battery or solar forms. Um, each of the stations, the monitoring stations, continue things mo uh, continuously monitor the airscape. Um, they can have up to fairly large detect detection distances, these antennas of 10 to 20 kilometers. Um, extremely high temporal precision. There's no need to recapture the animals. The stations do that for you. Um, uh, central data management, which is key to the whole thing. And we're working with multiple technology partners. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Now, I appreciate we have a breadth. That little poll at the beginning was very informative. Uh, so we have a, a breadth of uh, experience here. So I'm going it, to interesting to kind of touch on all the, the basics and get it a little bit more advanced. So, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so in theory, now this is a, a suite of stations uh, ranging from the southern tip of South America to the Andes in Colombia and coastal Nova Scotia and in, in southern Ontario. And in theory, how MODIS works is that if a tag registered with the network flies anywhere um, in the world through a registered receiver, all that data uh, gets sent back to our central database um, at uh, modis.org. Go ahead. So there are many different technologies and sort of options available. Um, there's a very steep learning curve to MODIS um, and we've been trying to keep up with this and continuing to update our resources on the website. So if you go to modis.org slash resources, uh, you can learn and compare different tag types, different manufacturers, different receivers, and there's sort of a FAQ type questionnaire to sort of walk you through. And if you have any questions that you're not uh, familiar with, feel free to reach out to us uh, anytime at modis.org or on the MODIS listserv, um, which is sort of a clearinghouse for any MODIS related questions. So um, we support low tech nano tags and a suite of CTT, cellular tracking technology, life tags and power tags that operate on separate frequencies. Uh, but the tag price is always gonna be around that $200 a tag mark. And then we support a number of receivers, the open source sensor gnome, CTT sensor stations and low tech SRX components. And depending on the nature of your station, you're looking at four to 10K. Um, but they can get really expensive if you want to get uh, if you want to get crazy with it. Next, birds have the power to touch our hearts with their beauty and songs, to surprise and fascinate us with their behavior, to inspire us with amazing feats of strength and endurance. Some songbirds migrate thousands of kilometers every year in challenging conditions. 
birds play critical roles in our ecosystems. They pollinate plants and spread seeds. They help control insects. Birds are also valuable indicators of change. Many populations have been seriously declining for decades. One third of North American bird species need urgent conservation action to avoid extinction. We have to act now to protect the habitats and systems that support all life on Earth. But how? Scientists must unlock the mysteries of migratory birds and study their movements on breeding grounds, along migration routes, and in wintering areas. The MODIS Wildlife Tracking System uses tiny tracking devices and a network of hundreds of receiving stations strategically located throughout the Western Hemisphere. MODIS is yielding spectacular discoveries. Now, researchers can safely track bird movements over vast distances and with incredible detail to pinpoint the greatest threats to vulnerable species. The results help us identify conservation priorities and direct efforts and funds for maximum impact. We have the power to make a big difference with your support. Okay, thanks, sir. Uh, so that video just, go ahead. Yeah, that, that video saves me a little bit of breath uh, and kind of frames the whole, uh, the whole point and philosophy behind MODIS. Um, so how MODIS works um, is the central database and we have projects and users tagging animals and embarking on collaborative research projects. Those animals fly around the world detected by our receiving stations and all that data goes back to the central repository. Uh, where that data is processed and sent back to the users is stored in a, our public repository, which is shared online, um, and then also um, making connections uh, to other repositories like MoveBank and the AKN. And it's all for the purpose of, of conservation science, um, whether that means basic discovery and influencing policy and management and public education as well. So that's sort of how it works, but what makes MODIS tick? Uh, Sarah, you can go to the next. is a, a number of, um, I guess, different sectors that all sort of have to be w working on together, but also working in, in tandem. So we obviously have the, the projects and collaborators or cooperators um, that are doing their own things in, in labs uh, around the world um, and governments and non-government organizations as well. The animals obviously play a critical role. We have to maintain, um, install and maintain infrastructure and keep that infrastructure up to date. Now infrastructure is the, the stations on the ground, but there's also a, um, a very complex server uh, and data, data management backside to the infrastructure. There's a whole education and outreach component that we're just starting to touch on. And then technology is uh, constantly changing and that's where our, uh, our technology partners, low tech and cellular tracking technologies are, are playing a vital role. And then obviously the whole conservation science component. Um, which, uh, as I said before, the discovery, analysis, visualization, and tool aspects, data archive for future use and reuse, and then obviously the implications, hopefully, toward policy and management and ideally conservation action. So there's a lot to unpack with MODIS, and there's a lot, um, a lot going on. So this is the state of the network, more or less, today. Uh, you can carry on to the next, Sarah. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. And again. And we've experienced incredible growth uh, over the last um, five years since we've started to having well over a billion uh, sort of call them certified detections in the network. And uh, that graph is a, is a year old, so it's probably quite a lot more. Carry on, Sarah. I'll try and make up for some time here. Um, and uh, so over the course of time, MODIS is expanding. Uh, there's growing joys and growing pains. And the projection in 2022 is probably a little bit conservative at this point because it leaves out much development even in the Midwest um, is, uh, is probably where we're going to be at, at least in, in North America, based on what we know is going to be uh, going on. So carry on, Sarah. Uh, so just to give you a perspective of what um, sort of what data coming out of MODIS looks like. Um, we're going to go to my hometown, Long Point. This is in Southern Ontario on the North Shore of Lake Erie. Next, Sarah. And early on, um, we have a, an array of stations around Long Point, which allow us to detect animals as they're being tagged at any of our research stations of the 
of the Long Point Bird Observatory. And then we can tell when they, how long they're staying and, and, when they're, and when they're leaving and what direction they're traveling next. And when we break this down in detail, these tags are repeating themselves quite regularly. Um, and each of the panels on this plot uh, show signal strength and then are a different uh, direction on an antenna. Um, and I don't have control of my cursor, so I can't explain it as well. Um, but essentially, we have um, periods of activity when birds are feeding and active that we can differentiate from periods of rest when they're sleeping. Um, the orange line is, is sunrise and then the birds being very active. Very well done there, Sarah. And if we carry on to sunset and the birds uh, go to sleep, and then you'll see a peak of activity. And if the inset on the far right shows that peak of activity zoomed in. And this is actually the bird taking flight leaving station A, crossing station B, um, and arriving at station C, essentially just leaving, um, uh, leaving Long Point and then crossing Lake Erie. And if you go to the next one, I'll show you a bit more carefully. And again. Um, so here's another uh, example looking at the data in a slightly different way. So each color in this case is a different antenna direction. And again, you'll see this quiescent period just after sunset when the bird is just resting and then waking up and taking flight and then departing away from the station. Um, and then depending on what antennas the birds are detected on as they're leaving a station, we can infer migratory direction. So in this case, um, the average of those two antennas being about 165 degrees. Um, so that's a very local, very specific, small scale information. When we scale up even farther, this is uh, an animation of birds leaving Bruce Peninsula Bird Observatory um, at the top there as they transect through Ontario. And there's a few uh, notable patterns, some of the which uh, some of them take a long time to get through the province, which is stopovers. Others are very quick, uh, which is probably overnight flights. And you'll notice this pattern. I can't really show it, but um, you'll see the sort of ring of green, which is the Niagara Escarpment. And just in this small scale with relatively small sample sizes, we can start to see propensities for birds following landscapes. And in that case, it's called the Niagara Escarpment, which is a green feature in the, in the landscape, which a lot of these birds uh, are honing into and following. Next. And we can scale up again one step further, and these are Swainson's thrush in orange leaving Columbia. Uh, gray cheek thrushes will be gray leaving Columbia. And it was part of a, a number of collaborative studies focusing on uh, overwinter use uh, and stopover ecology of the thrushes in Columbia. And then, but as we uh, surmise that when they leave Columbia, there's a pretty good chance they're going to be detected in North America. And it turns out we detected more than more than 40% of the birds tagged in Columbia were detected elsewhere in the array. And if we let that play again, Sarah, um, if it'll allow, you'll see some slow folks and you'll also see what I call this really, really fast ones. And those are birds that embarked, particularly watch the gray cheek thrushes. Uh, the Swainson's thrush sort of take the lazy route, but the gray cheek thrushes cross the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico and look carefully at, there's a fast one, and there's a couple more, there's another one. Um, so these are birds that are embarked on, on non-stop flights and based on the energy consumption and fat stores that they occur in Colombia, um, it was, you know, estimated that they could probably embark on, on large long stop flights taking them to the continental United States. Um, but in this case, we were able to actually confirm that they're embarking on non-stop flights all the way. Um, and uh, you can skip to the next flight, uh, sorry, the next slide. And there's a really pretty little story that goes along with this. These are each four different birds being detected as they reach the coast on uh, in Grand Isle, Louisiana. And this upside down, this parabola is sort of the typical pattern of a bird crossing an antenna. The signal strength peaks as they cross the antenna and then declines as they, as they fall away. So each four of these great cheek thrushes all left Columbia on May 17th. They flew overnight May 17th, they flew through the day May 18th, they flew overnight May 18th, and on the morning of May 19th, they arrived at 5.30, just after six, and then these last two, I like to say that they, um, they flew wingtip to wingtip all the way as they crossed uh, Louisiana, and then theoretically, some of them continued on um, even farther from there. Next. This led to a, a number of publications, particularly one um, by Camila Gomez and, and others, uh, showing that the, the, the pace, um, both the pace and how far um, birds from Colombia will migrate in North America is dependent on how, many fuel, how much fuel they accrue while they're in the, in the Santa Marta Mountains of Colombia. Um, so from a bang, conservation bang for the buck scenario, the, 
you know, that area of Columbia for great cheek thrushes, probably a number of other species as well. Um, there's a, a huge uh, incentive to conserve that area. It just also happens to be one of the most biodiverse places on the planet as well. So this is how we can sort of tie things in from the very local scale all the way up. And then similarly, using an example by Nick Bailey um, of uh, black pole warblers, which again, theoretically, were surmised to be able to do these long um, sort of oceanic flights toward the continental US. Um, and we use MODIS data to sort of confirm that, uh, yes, they were heading there and that the theory, uh, the theoretical limitations for black poles at least uh, are true. Next, you'll probably have to click twice. And carry on. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to show you an example of sort of a, a, a breeding, breeding grounds based on barn swallows, which have experienced ex extremely high declines, especially in southern Ontario. And these are two examples of uh, post-breeding dispersal and uh, for the survival analysis of barn swallows. So these are barn swallows that were tagged near Guelph, which is sort of the upper right corner of the map. Um, and then basically they're, they're uh, post-breeding dispersal as they go throughout the province. Um, and then these data, you can go to the next one, Sarah. I'm not sure what's going to be next. These data were used to estimate survival of animals as those that were maintained in the array um, would have survived and those that were lost from the array were uh, presumed to have died up until the point where they migrated. And these are two examples of post-breeding dispersal uh, throughout Southern Ontario and then a migration. And uh, you can go to the next. So what was determined by um, this study is that um, we could actually measure survival from the point where a bird was uh, left the nest uh, until they migrated um, over the course of time. And it turned out that young, at least in Ontario, just have 42% survival. Um, and uh, when you do the math, it means that a, a female barn swallow needs to reproduce two or three times before she reproduces herself. So this is helping us to identify bottlenecks and potentially population limitations. Um, and this can also extend to, uh, to many other species. Um, this is a great example in the aerial insectivore realm. Next. And I'd be remiss if we didn't mention bats, um, particularly migratory tree bats, but there's been lots of done on more sedentary myotis um, and, uh, and other cave dwelling bats. So this is a beautiful red bat um, sporting a modus tag. Next. And uh, particularly when one of the other MMN uh, objectives is the Wind and Wildlife Coalition. And um, we think we don't know a lot about birds. We are very spoiled in the bird world. We know a lot and we can start to ask really interesting questions. But in the bat world, um, we know very little, particularly about migration. Uh, so this is just one example of how by tracking migratory bats, we can learn more about how they navigate the Great Lakes um, or lake shores and features in general. And uh, for this example, we sort of put to rest the question of whether or not bats cross the Great Lakes. Um, in this case, uh, silverhead bats of uh, all age and sex categories actively cross the lake around Long Point. Many went around the lake as well, but I didn't show that data here. And lastly, insects. There's your cue. Next. Thanks. And we can do the same with large insects, although we'll probably start narrowing it down, such as darners and monarchs. Um, and these are some pilot examples um, by Knight et al. Um, showing uh, migratory flights again from the Bruce Peninsula through Ontario. Uh, some of these dragonflies doing 600 kilometers in the, in the matter of a, of, a, of a week or so and same with the monarchs. Next. So um, there's a variety of, of different things we can do with the data. There's the, the pure science, interpreting that into policy and management tools and, and conservation action is a, uh, is a very difficult big problem. And a big part of conservation is also education and outreach. So Birds Canada has been working to develop um, guides. You can just click through the next couple slides, Sarah. Um, so this educator guides on the website uh, for sort of more of the hands-on availability. Um, and each school that's registered on the education site Sorry, you can go back. Um, we're providing sort of more up-to-date summaries um, and, uh, and case studies for students to learn, uh, or you can do at home with, uh, with COVID and all the homeschooling, you could lose yourself and your kids in the education website for, uh, for quite a little while on stations near you. Uh, and these will be developing into new platforms that we're working on. So in sort of not quite closing, but close, the, really the biggest take home message is that MODIS is kind of the perfect example in practice of community science. You have a, a community of scientists and organizations and individuals working together, often unbeknownst to one another, um, that what they're doing is, is uh, you know, very, being very important to other projects around the hemisphere. 
Um, and it's a global network of researchers and practitioners that all work together. Uh, we're collecting very complementary fine scale information and some broader scale uh, information and it's accessible and relatively affordable an important piece of our uh, uh, the puzzle in our golden age of, of big bird data. So we can go to the next slide. Um, by the numbers, we're currently operating in four continents, 31 countries. There's 900 receiving stations. We've tagged 200 species and tw almost 24,000 individuals. Um, and there's hundreds of projects of, to date and collaborators and close to 110 publications. Um, and so most of this is happening independently in silos and labs, but obviously every project with MODIS, I know of very few that don't rely on um, the effort and stations from other projects. Um, and we're just starting to sort of um, just to scratch the surface of what we can do with this data holistically um, by combining data across years and across species. And we hope in the next year or two, we'll really be able to dig into to what's sort of hiding in the data because every project only just scratches the surface um, of the depth of the data that's available. Next. Again, a huge thank you to everybody. I can't thank all of the collaborators. And if you just go to the next slide, Sarah, and sort of closing, I'm not sure how these are gonna be organized. So what's next in the Midwest? Um, I, we didn't have a lot of time. As Sarah mentioned, this is a very sort of a, an intro to get everybody sort of up to speed, um, learning more about MODIS um, and starting to grow together. But uh, b behind the scenes, we're starting to embark on a strategic planning process to try and organize things um, and make a more sustainable path with the, the greatest output for, for migratory animals moving forward. Um, and that's a, that's a big, um, that's a big task and there are a number of different uh, sort of regional coordination bodies and groups like this in the Midwest. There's the Northeast MODIS collaboration and there's also um, the Western Working Group and, and others taking shape across, uh, across the Western Hemisphere at least. And um, this, so this is sort of stage one in the Midwest is getting everybody together and learning um, who's doing what where uh, and then we'll be following up um, as a follow-up to this will be sort of more targeted questions with targeted groups about how we move forward. Um, and, uh, and there's a great sort of network developing. You can just, Sarah, I don't want to, I've probably gone over time already. Um, so I don't want to take any more of your time. And um, so I can just stop it there um, and we can get into more of the, um, the overarching big questions maybe in our follow-up presentations or we'll see where the questions lead. Um, but uh, I know I've yammered on. Uh, Enough. No, that was wonderful. Thank you, Stu, very, very much for that high level intro to um, MODIS. We really need that as a group, I think, especially with this group, because there are some folks who are very new to it, some people who are already pros. Um, and so thank you very much for your, uh, sharing your knowledge. And Stu will be sticking around. So if we have some questions towards the end, which I know we will, we're getting a little short on time, which is okay. Um, yeah, I'll we, be quick. There's only one more slide that was left off that is sort of critical importance to the whole thing, and I hope it came across, is that we have the opportunity with MODIS to study sort of aspects of the entire life cycle using one uh, device at mm -hmm. numerous different scales um, and combining it with different technologies. So it's not the be all and end all, it's just part of the pie. And I look forward to hearing um, uh, about what else uh, these excellent researchers have to show. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Stu. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm up next. I'm just going to talk about MODIS in Missouri and the Midwest. Um, I'm going to zoom through some of these. Um, Stephanie, can you verbally tell me if you can see the slides okay? Because yep. I can't see anymore. Okay. All right, so I, I gave an intro yesterday on the telemetry initiative. I'm going to go past some of these slides in the beginning since we're a little bit behind on time. Um, but yes, our telemetry initiative is to expand MODIS across the region and beyond um, to kind of build up these partnerships. So I made a point here to say, as, as Stu mentioned, this it, MODIS is a definite learning curve. Um, but seriously, if I can dabble in it and put up receivers, then anyone can. I do not have a background in communications or radio telemetry or anything like that. But, um, and this is not my full-time job, it's only part of it. Um, so it is a learning cu curve, but if I can do it, um, you can do it too. So just wanna give that a uh, boost at the beginning. But you. I showed this yesterday in the intro, but this is two years ago, there were all of these receivers missing in the Midwest. And we really were working with a black hole in the Midwest of MODIS receiver coverage. And just in the last two years, you see all of these receivers that have gone up um, 
it's just very heartening and and it's it's all happening kind of all at once so this is our midwest migration network strategic modus receiver plan it is um very optimistic but i think we can get there or some um some representation of this you can see that a lot of these receiver lines are in these digital fence arrays where the detections kind of overlap so that you're creating a, that digital fence of receiver coverage they're along latitudinal lines for north south migration um, or along major waterways uh, rivers and the great lakes so uh, the midwest migration network telemetry group does have a list of focal species for your perusal um, you can contact me for that i believe they're on our website um, but if they're not, just reach out to me and I'm happy to share that with you. So tier one, um, the, the, the MMN steering committee developed this four tier system for ranking the importance of potential focal species. This occurred before my um, coming on with the MMN, but if you have questions about that, I'm sure Amber Roth would be happy to answer those questions of how they were assigned. But these are the criteria of how these species were assigned to tier one, tier two, tier three, and four. And so a lot of it um, adhered to Partners in Flight's Avian Conservation Assessment Database, the ACAD. Um, those designations, or they have to have over or equal to, and have to have over or equal to 5% of the breeding population in the Midwest, things like that. So they were set criteria. Um, but these are just a real quick view at the tier one and tier two species. I won't go through all of those, but just for your knowledge, and I'm happy to share that with you. Also, as Amber mentioned yesterday in the introduction to the MMN, we have research questions that we want to focus on as well. I won't go through all of these in the interest of time since Amber did yesterday, but again, these are for your perusal. If you all are thinking of MODIS or tracking research in the future in the region, maybe consider how we can answer some of these questions. But these are available from the MMN to gain support or lend support to grant proposals and other things like that, partnerships, um, to show a little bit more focus to those research efforts. So Missouri, so we want to do what folks have done in the Northeast um, and in Pennsylvania, they have an overlapping digital fence across the state. So that's what we want to do in Missouri. Yes, I drew this outline of the state. It is beautiful. I know everybody is applauding. I just can't hear you. Um, but there are two uh, digital fence lines, not to be outdone by Pennsylvania, we want to put two up, but there's one in the north and one in the south. The one in the south is in our uh, Ozark forests, a lot of contiguous um, oak hickory and pine forests down there. And then we have our glaciated plains up north. So more grassland birds up north and in the west and those forest birds down in the south where a lot of neotropical migrants depend on that for stopover habitat as well as breeding. So there is a method to the madness. Um, not to, um, I would be remiss without mentioning that we need more receivers on stopover sites in Central America and South America and on the wintering grounds. And so every single time we try and put in uh, for a grant proposal or get funds, um, or raise funds through our Conservation Heritage Foundation. We always try and think of partners we can work with to place more receivers uh, down south as well. We can't forget that because that's, we need them down there just as much as up here. So this was a, um, a Region 3 Migratory Birds U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grant that we got a few years ago to place 12 receivers. And so we reached out to Illinois um, to show a, a broader um, range and we there are six in Missouri, the St. Louis Zoo, Illinois Natural History Survey, and American Bird Conservancy were our partners on this. We're placing six in Missouri, four in Illinois, and two in Guatemala. You see the dots down at the bottom. Um, and here, well, we can just skip that. And then we just submitted a massive sea swig, which is a competitive state wildlife grant um, proposal through the Fish and Wildlife Service um, with um, five other state agencies and I think five other nonprofit partners um, to fund motor rece MODIS receiver placements. So we would purchase the MODIS supplies and tags and then send those out to the partners to get those in their hands and then their buy-in to the project is to place those. So this proposal has 59 new MODIS stations. Um, they'll be dual listening stations for nano tags and CTT. Again, this is just a proposal. We haven't heard yet, but it would place 48 of those receivers in eight states in the Midwest. Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and then 11 out of country on the Yucatan, uh, Costa Rica, and Colombia. It would also, this proposal, support three research projects, Golden Wing Warbler work in Wisconsin with Amber at the University of Maine. That's supposed to say Golden Wing Warbler, not Blue Wing Warbler, and wood thrush tagging on spring migration. That's working with partners Selva and Missouri Department of Conservation to place 50 tags, 25 on each of those species during spring migration. 
And then tracking by Minnesota DNR of American Kestrels, uh, both juvenile and adult movements. So that's very exciting. It was a big proposal, has all of these partners in it. So this will be me until October. Um, we've also here in Missouri raised $20,000 for modus receiver placement just in Missouri through our Missouri Conservation Heritage Foundation, which is amazing. And those range from a $50 donation from someone who saw a presentation on it and donated 50 bucks for their friend's birthday to an Audubon chapter here in Missouri that donated like $9,000 for a receiver. So lots of little donations, but it adds up and it, that's really cool to see. Yeah, people get really excited about it. It's one of the few topics that you can present to, to an Audubon chapter or a master naturalist group and that people can donate to, um, lay people can donate to research. People get very excited about that. MODIS is just awesome. It's easy to get excited about. So I thought I would um, outline here a few tips that I kind of learned along the way if you're just starting to dip your toe in it. And there are way more than this, but these are the ones that just kind of rose to the top. Um, if you are thinking of, uh, deploying modus tags on species, uh, put up and release them at a station so that we get guaranteed points um, from those birds. Um, when you have ideas for tagging efforts using modus, um, reach out to other regional partners. So potentially you could spread the tags out over that region um, to get those large scale movements from multiple locations. When we saw Antonio's presentation from the bird banding lab yesterday, um, this is one of his slides from his presentations. And really, this is just kind of a note to say work to integrate localized monitoring um, of, of your individuals moving around with modus tags before they make those long distance movements. I have heard um, from folks at the bird banding lab that that helps you get permitted um, if you have a little bit of localized monitoring before those birds will move on. Again, if you're releasing them at a station, um, hopefully that does occur for a while if you're, if you're tagging them uh, on stopover sites. And then this is a um, slide from Mark Shieldcastle's presentation from his banding and ground survey session yesterday. Um, and again, just reach out to others and try, try for research collaborations. Um, um, it just, it always helps to try and deploy tags or put up receivers with others in mind. Um, if you're interested in putting up MODIS stations, find the gaps. Look at those maps on MODIS.org um, and really reference our MMN strategic plan for MODIS. Um, try and find where you can fit in there to create those digital fences or lines. Speak with myself or Stu. Uh, Amber Roth is another amazing contact for that. Um, another pro tip is to find wealthy people who think this is interesting. <laughs> I know in the Northeast, in Pennsylvania, they were able to put that line uh, because of a generous endowment by someone. And then I think uh, Stu recently told me that Tennessee wants to do a line of them too because someone donated a large amount of money. So, <laughs> make it really interesting <laughs> and present it to a lot of different people. It always helps. Um, okay, I will go back to sharing that screen actually because I forgot to put up my... Um, oh, I would like to work on regional expertise. I forgot this slide. Um, I, maybe to make how-to videos for people starting completely from scratch. Um, increase regional coordination, like I said, with tagging and projects. And this is MODIS right now, so we really need to help them. And if you are a regional technical expert, I think we can do better to form kind of a mini team for people who are just dipping their toe in the water. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this MODIS stuff without asking a lot of people a lot of questions uh, to really learn more. So. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end of the program. We are kind of behind, so I'd like to move on to the next presenter. But thank you all for your attention. I will stop share now. Our next presenter is Rich Keith. Rich, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen, that would be helpful. Um, Rich is the director of the Kalamazoo Valley Bird Observatory, a program of the Kalamazoo Nature Center KVBO does complete life cycle monitoring with particular focus on fall migration since 1974, maps since 1990, and daily census of spring migration since 1973. KVBO has coordinated both breeding bird atlases of Michigan, and Rich first learned of MODIS in 2015 and became inspired at the 2016 IBBA meeting when during a presentation on MODIS and gray-cheeked thrushes, Stu McKenzie said, we need MODIS in Michigan. And Rich took that as instruction and has been working to fulfill that objective ever since. So welcome, Rich. Are you able to share your screen? You're muted. <laughs> Brenda. There you go. Yeah, now you're Thank you. Muted. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to find that rich person you were talking about. That would make life oh, so much right. easier. <laughs> me too. Yes. Um, this is the reason that I do what I do. I've been banding for a lot of years, and uh, this may not have been a, a unique situation. I may have had this combination of birds in the past, but uh, this was the first time I had enough hands to take a picture like this. And uh, that's kind of what I live for, what's coming up in a couple of weeks here in this part of the country is this fall migration of the warblers. But Brent, you can't see your screen yet. Ah. Hi. Just a second. Bear with us, folks. It just wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without <laughs> something along those lines. I did it too. Sure. We've all been there. There you go. Okay. Yep, and just push play on that down at the bottom or up on the slideshow part. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Wow, okay, <laughs> all right. Sorry. <laughs> I really have to show this photo again. Like I say, I may have had this species in combination before, but never enough hands to take this picture. And it's what I live for. But Modus in Michigan, um, it took me uh, till 2018 to get my first uh, three towers up, which are in Kalamazoo County over on the left hand uh, of the screen at the Nature Center, Fort Custer and uh, Pittsfield. Um, from uh, South Carolina, we had, uh, they abandoned 19 ready turn zones. We had three fly over us, which were unexpected for them to take this path. We've had a red knot also from South Carolina, and which has been like 50 years since one of those has been recorded in the county. And we've recorded two Kirtland's warblers and they have never been recorded in the county. So all this just just continues to build my enthusiasm. Uh, right now we have about uh, um, 10 active towers in the state. We uh, would have more in, in the northern uh, lower peninsula. Smithsonian has been operating those in the Kirtlands area and I, I assume they're just not operating because of COVID this year. I haven't really talked to anybody to find out um, why those aren't active this year. But uh, the ones in yellow are uh, for the most part active, the ones on the right hand side of the screen on the east part of the state, uh, some from Ohio State down at the um, southern part. Um, one that's uh, crediting Great Lakes Audubon over here on the right, but I'm not sure that's actually who's operating that tower. That may be someone else, but they're the ones that gave me the information about these. Um, and they have plans for three more towers, the red um, pins, two there on Lake St. Clair at the northern part, and uh, one up at Wigwam Bay. Uh, in Saginaw Bay. Um, then over on the left side, on the uh, west side of Michigan, like I say, I have three towers that are active in, in uh, Kalamazoo. Oh, I should mention I have one at Kensington Metro Park, which is on the east side that's active. We've got four towers that are active. These five towers on the east side of the state, Grand Rapids, uh, three down in, well, two in Berrien County, one in Cass County, and one up in uh, Van Buren County, I think it is. Those are funded I've got my CTT motherboards a week ago. We have masks, we have locations, we have permissions, we have everything, and it's COVID. <laughs> so those will go up. I thought they'd be up this spring in 20, but maybe in 21, by 21 in the spring, I, I certainly hope we can have them up. But everything is literally just sitting here waiting to go up on those. The red pins from Kalamazoo over to the east, or the, uh, yeah, the east side of the state, uh, six of them. Those are the ones that are in the grant that Sarah just mentioned that we've put in the proposal. Um, got my fingers crossed if those come through. I uh, will have a continuous line from Lake Michigan to Lake Erie and that's been the goal on uh, doing this, a literal fence across lower Michigan. Okay. Um, as you can see in this picture though, I mean a whole lot of Michigan without any towers. Um, the Coast, most of the coast of Michigan and a lot of the coast of uh, Ontario. No, Huron, get it right yet. I learned these in school, honestly. Um, one thing I want to mention is that uh, I've been working with the uh, National Guard. Uh, we work here locally and they have 16 Guard armories in Michigan. 
A uh, number of them are on the coasts of the Upper and Lower Peninsula, and they are willing to cooperate and host um, towers if somebody has some, uh, wants a specific area, if they have the money to put up a tower and are looking for a location, please let me know and we'll see if there's an armory that's close to there that might want to be a, uh, a host for that receiving station. And I'm going to go to my Upper Peninsula. And Upper Peninsula has been very sparse, obviously. Uh, just in the last year, we've gotten two over in the Keweenaw Peninsula that are uh, up and running. Uh, at Whitefish Point over here on, uh, on the bay, we've had that one up for, I think, three years now that that's been up. But that's been pretty much it for the Upper Peninsula. But the other three red dots, three, uh, three red pins in the Upper Peninsula, Gladstone, Marquette, and Sault Ste. Marie, um, I just received $13,900 from the National Guard, and that's going to pay for the equipment to put stations at those three locations. Now, I haven't ground truth the three locations. I'm assuming they might have a mast and they might have electricity and all these things. I've got to actually go to those armories and physically inspect them to make sure that's going to work, but they're funded. And if it doesn't go at those three sites, there will be three stations going up somewhere in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Uh, again, still leaving quite a bit of territory not covered, but it's a pretty good improvement. Uh, that other red pin at the uh, top of the lower peninsula is a UN bio station. They're actually planning to put up two. That's one of them. And I, another one that I didn't get the pin on the map uh, down further south. And then they've got ambitions to put a couple in the upper peninsula, but nothing that's certain yet. So the, the red pins and the yellow pins on this are either actual stations or ones that are almost certainly going to be erected uh, whenever those kind of things are, are happening again, hopefully yet, maybe late this year, maybe next year, whenever they can go up. But at that point, we'll have approximately 30, um, and these should be all year-round stations. Uh, the part of the problem with the Smithsonian station, station down at uh, um, Grayling is that they do take those down every winter, they don't leave them up, so they're not there for all of the spring and fall migration. But uh, it's coming, but there's still a lot of need. And that probably is less than 10 minutes, but I think that's all I really have. us up rich thank you very much for, for outlining um your efforts in michigan i they have been broad and swift so well done you're you i like that you took Stu's comment as <laughs> direction um it's easy to do i know that the the minute that i learned of modus i was also very inspired by it and came home and tried to figure out what we could do to home so thank you rich i appreciate it Okay, our next speaker is Annie Bracey. Um, Annie is at the Avian Ecology Lab at the Natural Resource Research Institute at University of Minnesota. Uh, Annie says, most of my research is currently focused on common terns and Great Lakes wetland birds, but the Avian Ecology Lab is primarily focused on forest bird research. She's only been working with MODIS for the last two years. So that's very similar to me as well. So Annie, uh, welcome and take it away. I think she's back. There she is. We can't hear you. I think you're muted still. Is that, can you hear me now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me get my... okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, I work um, at the Natural Resources Research Institute in Dr. Alexis Grendy's lab. And we have been tracking common terns. Um, nesting in the Duluth Superior Harbor and in Ashland, Wisconsin. Um, in recent years, we used uh, geolocators to track adults um, to identify large scale migration routes and overwintering sites. Um, we've also used archival GPS tags to look at foraging behavior um, on the breeding grounds and to pinpoint, um, get some higher accuracy resolution in where they're migrating. Um, and during the winter. And so MODIS really fits in nicely because we are especially interested in tracking juveniles. And of course, they're tricky. And um, because of their deferred breeding, the juveniles either will not come back to the colony or most likely wouldn't return for multiple years. So the fact that we can get data from these birds with ever rehandling them 
was what was really obviously drawing for us. Um, initially, so it's called, our project's called Mapping Aided Movements in Minnesota. And you can see it's specifically targeting the western tip of Lake Superior. So initially we were interested in having full coverage or a lot of motor stations throughout the state, but based on funding, we decided to prioritize placing the stations along the north and south shore of the western tip of Lake Superior, um, especially because not just for our project, but it's an important migration route. Um, and we figured that those locations would be useful for um, other people tracking birds all over the globe. So um, our, yeah, our first objective was to um, set up these stations. We didn't have any problem finding hosts for the stations. Um, we put some up on learning centers, uh, on top of a high school in two harbors, and then private landowners as well. So um, all 10 of the stations were hosted relatively quickly. We got these stations um, set up in 2018. This slide is just showing um, where they are. So from Lutzen on the North Shore, down um, into the Duluth Superior Harbor and along the South Shore of Lake Superior um, into the Bayfield Peninsula. So then a more specific um, project, which is um, tracking the common turns, like I said, we did also set up um, an omnidirectional MODA station on Interstate Island, which is in the Duluth Superior Harbor where these birds are nesting. Um, so that would give us more information about um, departure and arrival dates um, for these birds. And again, we are specifically interested in um, documenting dispersal of hatchier birds. So this next slide is just showing some tracks from the archival GPS tags that we had put on adults, um, highlighting some of the areas where we had a lot of um, locations, Lake Erie, um, in Florida and along the um, east coast of the United States and um, uh, in coastal Peru as well. And so I just put the MODA stations and then our tag tracks to, again, um, this was the reason we thought that MODIS was an ideal um, system for us to track juvenile turns because of where we know the adults travel anyways. So in 2019, we deployed radio transmitters on 16 adults and 13 hatchier birds in the Duluth Superior Harbor. Um, we were interested in tracking family groups. So the adults were all mated pairs. Um, unfortunately, we had really high um, predation rates that year. And so it was very difficult for us to, uh, there was a lot of nest failure. So we were only actually able to associate two of those 13 hatcher birds with radio marked adults. And this is just a screenshot from the MODIS website of the raw tracks that we got from our birds in 2019. So again, here you can see that uh, a lot of birds were picked up in Lake Erie and then um, on the southeastern coast of uh, the United States as well. Um, just some really basic information um, for last detection on the breeding colony for adults was the average was August 1st and for hatchier birds it was August 15th. Um, almost all of our birds that were detected elsewhere were um, in Lake Erie and I think almost all of them were detected at the um, long point tip. So we know those birds are it's an important stopover location for them. Um, another um, just basic summary is that the average number of days between leaving the colony and their next detection for adults, it was roughly 12 days. And for hatchier birds, um, it was 40. And then the one family group that we actually got uh, returned hits on, we can see that the um, male and female adults and the one hatchier female um, all left, seemingly left the colony August 14th and 15th. The female and the juvenile were uh, picked up at stations in Lake Erie. 
for 21 days for the female and 38 for the hatch year. And then the male was picked up in Florida, oops, pardon me, in Georgia, the female in Florida, and then um, the hatch year bird was last detected in Lake Erie. And so you can see some of those dates of departure. And so we were hoping to get more information about postnatal care and um, just how the family groups worked. Of course, having a sample size of one wasn't super helpful. Um, so we decided that in 2020, we would um, prioritize putting the tags out on juveniles since those are the um, birds we were primarily interested in um, and the least is known about their movements. Um, so this year, um, we observed nine of the 16 adults that we fitted with radio tags in 2019 um, and captured seven of those birds to remove the tags. And then we deployed 30 radio transmitters on hatcher birds um, and just finished doing that last week. Uh, so we will look forward to spending the winter um, updating our sites. If I can try not to do it daily, that will be amazing. Um, and then of course, uh, figuring out where these hatcher birds are spending the winter and having identified coastal Peru as an important location for adults during the wintering time, we're really hoping to um, build some collaboration to get uh, a network set up on the coast of Peru as well. So that's something that we're gonna be actively pursuing this year if anyone knows of anyone or is interested or has any information about how that might be possible, um, it would be great to get a hold of us. And this is our lab website. Again, um, you can go there to get more information about the projects that we're working on. I focused on common terms, but there are other um, MODIS projects going on in our lab as well. That's all I have. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate your willingness to present. Um, that's a, such a great example of localized monitoring um, around a set area. You know, oftentimes when I'm explaining to people what MODIS is, it's for small animals over long, long distances. But you can see, like Annie has, when there are so many receivers at your disposal, uh, same as up in Ontario, too, you can really get at those localized movements in addition to the large scale ones. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Very informative. Um, to the group, please keep putting your questions in the chat box as we move along. Um, those will not be ignored. We will work to answer those afterward. Um, and my agenda only went to two, but we have until 2.30, and so we will have a lot of good discussion. It's okay that we're a little bit behind. So um, keep putting your good questions in there, and um, we'll go to the presenters if there's specific questions for them at the end. All right, next is... Chris Tonra. Chris is an assistant professor of avian wildlife ecology in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State, and he's been working with MODIS since 2015. So Chris, I will turn it over to you. Okay, um, so I was just going to give a, kind of a roundup both of the current status of our, um, uh, our array here in Ohio, both pre and uh, I guess during the pandemic, um, and then kind of what we've done with our array so far in terms of completed projects, current projects, and uh, what we're thinking about moving forward. Um, so this is what our array looked like uh, before the pandemic hit. Um, basically, we have uh, down south in Ohio, we have two stations in the Vinton Furnace Experimental Forest. I'll talk about what those, the main objective of those is. Um, one station on campus in, Col in Columbus at Ohio State, and then a number of stations up on the southwestern shore of Lake Erie um, that have been operated uh, since before I actually got here in 2014. Um, so that's the blow up on the right hand image there is showing all of our stations on the lake shore, um, which certainly we've produced the most work with those stations. Um, but uh, we've been really limited ever since March in terms of our ability to monitor these stations and that's resulted in uh, some unfortunate events um, and we're still kind of getting back uh, operating. So this is what we've lost to this point. Uh, we had one receiver go down up by the lake um, because it was invaded by ants. Um, it was unable to be repaired. I should say all of our stations are low-tech receivers. A uh, number of different models. Currently, we're using all the SRX 800s. 
um, but some of them are some of the older models. Um, then we had three towers go down due to the high winds, um, which we haven't had an issue with in previous years, but some of those tropical storm remnants um, really took a toll. Um, so we're currently down four towers up on the lake. Um, Wynas Point Marsh Conservancy is really uh, helping us out a ton right now. They've written in some time to one of their seasonal staff to um, help monitor all these. So Nicole Hangst and, and um, Brendan Shirky have been going around and checking on these. Um, so hopefully we'll have a better idea because some of these stations, especially the ones in Michigan, we still haven't gotten to since February. Um, also lost one of our stations in Vinton Furnace because somebody was kind enough to just steal uh, the receiver and the solar panels and everything. Um, so that's what our array looks like. We're hoping, you know, most of the damage was either to antennas or to masts. So uh, once we can get back up to full research capacity in terms of our ability uh, to work in the field, um, we should get most of those online. We might be redistributing some of them, but we kind of like to be contributing, especially on Lake Erie, to that portion of the, the lakeshore fence, so to speak, or the halo around the lake. Um, so that's what our array looks like. Um, to talk about projects, uh, to talk about the completed projects first. So the first stations in our array were actually established by Paul Rodewald um, and his master student at the time, Bryant Dossman. Um, and say that, so they published this work uh, looking at uh, stopover behavior and migratory routes of uh, American Red Start and Myrtle's Warbler, uh, Myrtle Warbler um, on the Lake Erie shoreline uh, using those stations on the southwestern shore there. So showing impacts of energetic condition, demographics um, on uh, departure behavior and also looking at cro lake crossing versus circumventing the lake and what predicted that. Um, so they did show a high proportion of these individuals cross the lake, even though they're on the pretty extreme western side of the lake. Um, so certainly had relevance to uh, planned uh, wind turbine installations uh, offshore on Lake Erie and, and that portion of the region. Um, so our first completed project we worked on and probably our most productive to date um, was looking at Rusty Blackbird stopover. This is done by my master student, Jay Wright. Um, so we've had two papers come out on this already and one uh, should be coming out uh, sometime soon in Condor. Uh, the main thing we used MODIS for was looking at stopover duration, um, getting really good departure dates uh, on spring migration after stopover on Lake Erie. You know, this is a rapidly declining species of concern. Um, relevant to what we've been talking about a lot today, um, we found that 75% of the birds cross the open water of the lake and that they are actually nocturnal migrants, which was not expected. We thought they would be diurnal migrants. So they're crossing the lake at night. Um, so certainly exposed to mortality risk from any wind turbine installations. Um, we also piggybacked uh, using the tags to get stopover habitat selection at multiple spatial scales. Uh, documenting roosting locations. Uh, so all of our objectives in these MODIS studies have primarily local objectives within our array, but all of them have been elevated by detections outside the array, uh, much like Stu referred to earlier in his talk. Um, so certainly I, I am a big advocate of if you're going to deploy tags, make sure you do so near local stations because that's where we've gotten the greatest uh, level of our, our highest quality of data. Also documented extremely long stopover durations, relocations of up to 30 kilometers within the stopover landscape. Uh, so all of that possible both with our array and the larger MODIS array. Um, the other completed project that I started soon after coming here was done by my master's student, Christy Stein. And this was working with a, a black crowned night heron colony on Lake Erie on West Sister Island and a smaller colony in the Sandusky Bay, uh, tagging juveniles in the nest or nestlings in the nest, and then tracking them um, the, uh, both uh, within the year to get post-fledging survival and also getting juvenile survival and recruitment rates to the population. We used the largest MODIS tags available. So these lasted for two years with a 10 second pulse rate. Um, 
and found some differences, males and females and post-fledging survival, which was pretty interesting. Um, I'll just put it out there. If anybody's a demographic modeler interested in uh, collaborating on doing some additional analysis, we would like to do some more in-depth multi-state modeling or spatial mark recapture um, using the larger, modus, lo larger scale modus detections that we got for these birds, but primarily used our local array um, to get these survival probabilities. Um, basically, we found that if they make it off the colony, they have very high survival rates. Most of our mortalities happened on the colony after fledging from the nest, but before they left the island of the colony. Um, we also have one that's sort of completed, uh, Nicole Hankst and Jim Hansen, uh, who are both master students here. Nicole's defending this summer, um, have been tracking Virginia rails from the Winus Point Marsh Conservancy. Uh, and this really started because initially they were going to do just VHF transmitters and then found a lot of their VHF transmitter birds were disappearing. And this was actually happening during one of the survey windows for the marsh bird surveys, uh, the, the regional marsh bird surveys. So they wanted to know where these birds were going. Were they just dispersing locally or were they actually detecting migrants during those surveys? Um, and it turns out there were quite a few of the birds detected during those windows meant to count and get occupancy for breeding birds, they were actually detecting a lot of migrant birds. Um, and so had a lot of recommendations for optimizing the survey periods based on region because it seemed like the protocols did not capture um, breeding only, the breeding only population at the site. Um, so that's our, our completed projects. This one still, like I said, the, the theses are still being written up and defended. Um, but look for some more results for that in the future. So our current projects, uh, one that's very local scale using those two towers in Southern Ohio at the Vinton Furnace Experimental Forest is using MODIS tags both to track overwinter survival of blue jays and their seed caching dispersal behavior. Um, a lot of this focused on oaks, but also we've added a component of uh, chestnut given the goals to reintroduce the hybrid uh, the developed hybrids of American chestnut that are blight resistant. Um, so we've actually been putting MODIS tags inside chestnuts. Those chestnuts in the middle there are sealed with wood putty because they have a MODIS tag inside and getting blue jays to cache those chestnuts and finding them with receivers to get cache locations like the one shown on the right and then doing out plantings in those locations. But using our MODIS towers, we're primarily using those two towers to add our detections for survival, um, for overwinter survival for the blue jays themselves. Um, and this is Jay Wright who did the Rusty Blackbird project. He's now a PhD student of mine and Steve Matthews uh, uh, leading this project. And then the last current project we have is uh, a project by an undergraduate uh, honor student of mine, Valerie Gawk, using our station here on campus. Uh, well, not on campus, won't be for a while probably. Um, but uh, our, at our banding station that I have at a urban wetland located on the OSU campus in Columbus, uh, where we've been putting modus tags on white-throated sparrows and also inducing feather growth in the tail to get feather court, um, to look at feather court during the overwintering period and using the modus tags to get departure date um, and looking at the relationship. So this is just some preliminary data here from just seven birds. Uh, but found about, you know, 30.3 uh, R squared there of birds with higher court um, during the winter having later departure dates. Um, and then we're also getting detections in the larger network given there's a lot of MODIS towers north of us. So when these birds leave in the spring, we're getting a lot of detections. And as you can see, a lot of these birds, like I mentioned with the warblers and like with the rusty blackbirds, are crossing the open water of Lake Erie. Um, so in terms of future projects, that's kind of where I've been investing my time in putting proposals out is looking at lake crossing behavior. Um, as I know, Mark Shieldcastle and folks at Black Swamp and I'm sure other folks on this um, have been thinking about because, because of our coverage of Lake Erie, we can get really good um, estimates of the, the rate at which birds are crossing the open water of the lake. Um, but also I've been interested in looking at the uh, sort of the, the extent to which birds are funneling to certain portions of the lake. 
Uh, so I would like to do deployments of tags in central Ohio, but across a longitudinal gradient um, to see if birds are just kind of proceeding northward and crossing wherever they hit the lake, or if they're concentrating in certain portions. You can see our white-throated sparrows there, a lot of them crossing by the Lake Erie Islands. Um, so just to close up, I just wanted to mention a couple of funding opportunities. I'm sure we'll talk about um, larger extramural funding opportunities, but I've been, uh, I went through one round on these two internal OSU grants. And if anybody's interested in collaborating on these, I just wanted to put these out there. So these are no, over, no overhead, no uh, match grants um, that I can bring in on collaborators on um, both through the Ohio State Energy Partnership, which would be funds for research. They generally max out the grants at 40 to 80,000. Um, they give out 800,000 worth in grants every year, but we would have to prioritize, they want to prioritize energy sources that go to OSU. Um, so OSU does receive wind energy, but obviously not from the icebreaker project on Lake Erie at this time. Um, so need to think about, uh, I did not get it on this round, but that was the advice I received was emphasizing more of this, these sources from, uh, that Ohio State is receiving. And the other one is this uh, Center for Human Animal Interaction. Um, they will fund two years of a graduate student, um, but they want to see clear human population impacts, either economics or some sort of social objectives, um, which is not my bailiwick. Um, Certainly there's human uh, aspects of, of a project on wind energy and the, the effects on wildlife populations, but they wanted more of a direct human impact, such as you know, the economic impacts of increased mortality of migrants or something like that. So just wanted to put those out there. Feel free to contact me um, if you uh, are interested in potentially uh, collaborating on one of these, um, but I will end there. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and projects with us. Um, Chris, at the beginning, reminded us of some of the joys of modus stations, which are ants, vandalization, and storms. <laughs> it's a good time. Um, I just visited five of our sites in the south to download the data, and someone had come up to the electric pole and shut off power to the entire communications tower on April 25th, right in the middle of the migration. <laughs> oh, well, it's okay. It happens. Um, so thank you also for sharing funding opportunities. That's great. That's great. So thank you for doing that. I'm going to share my screen again to show the video that we have. This is a replay. If you saw the plenary by Pete Mara, this will be a replay for you. This is a project of Nathan Cooper with Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center and Pete Mara with at Georgetown University. Um, and they tagged Kirtland's warblers using MODIS uh, technology. And this is their movements around the breeding territories. There is narration by Nathan's wife on the video telling us what is going on. Please note that this is um, spring migration right at the beginning of the video. It will go through the dates right here. And white movements are typical space use, and then the colors are alternative space use. So I will go ahead and hit play. What we are going to watch here is an animation showing movements of 99 adult male and female Kirtland's warblers that were captured and radio tagged on their wintering grounds in the Bahamas. This map shows the northern lower peninsula of Michigan, where 97% of the world's population of Kirtland's warblers breed. The open black polygons indicate all breeding habitat in the region, and black diamonds indicate the 12 automated telemetry towers we use to track these birds. Look at the text box in the upper left corner to see the current date and what stage of the breeding season we are in at any given time. Once the animation begins, we'll see both white paths and colored paths. White paths indicate birds exhibiting a typical territorial space use strategy, while the colored paths indicate 19 individuals that will eventually adopt an alternative space use strategy. We're going to start the animation in early May when most birds are in the midst of their 2800 kilometer journey from the Bahamas to Michigan. The action begins on May 9th when the first male arrives to Michigan. Birds first arrive one at a time and then the pace picks up with more and more individuals arriving each day. Notice that individuals are often detected at multiple towers but quickly settle at their eventual breeding areas. 
By May 26th, most birds have arrived and the earliest arrivers have begun to build their nests. Four days later, on May 30th, these early arrivers have laid eggs and start incubating them. And by June 5th, most females are now on eggs. Note that other than a few late arrivers, large scale movements have stopped. Eggs laid in the earliest nests begin to hatch and adults start feeding their young by June 13th. Watch, this is when we start to see some unexpected long distance movements. 11% of breeders and 60% of non-breeders shown in color begin moving to other spatially disjunct breeding areas five to 77 kilometers away, while typical breeders shown in white remain on their small breeding territories. These large scale movements continue through the nestling period when parents visit the nest to feed young up to 16 times per hour. Even more movements take place during the fledgling period when fledglings begin moving around and making loud species specific begging calls. These cues provide publicly available information about reproductive success and habitat quality in the area. The fact that these long distance movements only occur during the nestling and fledgling periods provides some confirmation that individuals are prospecting to help inform their decisions about where to disperse to in the following year. By July 20th, when many fledglings have gained independence from their parents, all long distance movements cease and do not begin again until more than two months later when fall migration begins. Okay. So I liked that. I liked that extended uh, explanation. Um, that was really helpful for me. So uh, next on our agenda is to start discussion. So I'm hoping this won't be too much of a free for all, but if you can please use your raise hand function. Um, Stephanie, can you give them instruction on where to find that please? Oh, is she there? Yep, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, if you if you go to participants, the participants screen, there should be a uh, either if it's on a more, if you click on more, uh, there should be a feature for raise hand and we can call on you if you can unmute you if you'd like to ask a question or we can, um, you can put your questions in the chat. Yep, or just say you want to talk in the chat. Um, that works too. We'll kind of monitor that. I wrote down some questions from the chat that we had through the early presentation. So I'd like to cover those. And Stu, if you're still there, if you could um, unmute and maybe help me answer some of these, I'll kind of defer to you. Um, so the first question was four to 10,000 includes installation. I know many of us uh, kind of put on this. Yeah, hey, that kind, of de that kind of depends. It can include installation. Um, you got to, well, it depends if you have volunteers or if you're putting it on your house or how far you have to travel or if you do it by helicopter. So, but you can set them up for four to 10 with installation, no problem. Yeah, here in Missouri, we have placed ours on existing MDC, our, our agency's communications towers. So that's nice. We already have uh, towers at high points in landscape and it's a tower that we can just attach our antennas uh, and receiver to. And if you're putting them on existing infrastructure and you're just buying the pieces to put them up there, we've put them up at about 3,300 bucks. So, um, so you can do it pretty cheaply if you have the infrastructure already. Um, upkeep slash subscription cost per year for a station. I know for a station, there aren't any recurring costs, um, but if you deploy tags, Stu, is it still 1500 a year? Uh, yeah, but that's being revised. So you can, you can bank on sort of a, a thousand a year for tagging projects and then a per tag fee, but there's no fee for maintaining stations in the array. Okay. Um, and also Josh Sayers has really helped. He's on, uh, works for MODIS too, and he's been answering a lot of questions uh, that came up in the chat. So thank you, Josh, for that. Um, another question was that our organization is looking to put up two receivers. They read that BSC covers the setup and installation of the tower. I think I know the answer to that, but can they help with the installation? Uh, <laughs> it depends on where you are and, um, it's usually cheaper to for alternatives, but we're happy to help as much as possible and facilitate where necessary. Um, but it's a much better if we uh, enable 
locals and everybody else and local knowledge and local champions to do uh, to do the work. We're happy to help as much as possible. Yeah, and that's that's the thing about um, that I would like to do in the future is to coordinate a little better regionally to provide kind of regional outlets for people to ask questions like Rich Keith, he's you know built his own from scratch. He knows this the the stuff in and out. Myself, whoever is around because it is a learning curve and when you're first stepping into it you're really not sure where to start so trying to coordinate that a little bit better so folks know who to reach out to i think would be very helpful um dave lapuma also helped answer questions about ctt thank you dave for doing that in the chat um we had another question other than birds is this technology being used in other wildlife we had that answered yes it's been used in um, bats some other mammals and large insects um, you can learn a lot more about that at the MODIS website. Um, what proportion of stations are operational slash active for data collection at any one time? So all those yellow dots you see on the MODIS.org website under receiver locations, all those maps we showed, those are active receivers. I think when they become inactive, you remove them from that map, right, Stu? Uh, yep, and then as more stations are going online, um, most of the data is being transferred in real time and very soon um, we'll have a tool for projects where you can see um, sort of the status of station when the data was last downloaded based on sort of a color code. So uh, red stations won't have data for the last like half a year or so. Um, so that'll allow you to look at a glance and see how um, up to date all the data is. Nice, that will be cool. Um, Jay asked what kind of upkeep maintenance is required on stations? How often is maintenance required at sites? So I'll kind of give a first crack at that. So uh, the station itself, the physical pieces of it, um, I have found in Missouri have been very low maintenance, but ours are on existing infrastructure. Chris may have a different answer. Everybody may have a different answer for this if they've put up modus receivers. Um, unless something physically breaks, it should be fine. Um, you know, our receivers, you have, if you, if you put them on an internet connection, you can remotely monitor them to see if they're still online. If they don't, it's tougher. Uh, like in my case, when I went down to Southern Missouri and downloaded the data and found that it hadn't been active or online because it didn't have an internet connection to check that. So it just kind of depends, you know, it's the cost of sending someone to download the data if you don't have an internet connection. And if you do, then that's great. The CTT sensor stations that listen on two frequencies uh, or more the modus, um, the more traditional modus frequency and then the CTT um, frequency, those all run off the cell network uh, for kind of a nominal fee to CTT when you order the sensor station. And so you never have to revisit those sites in theory unless someone, something, you know, goes wrong. Um, so that's a great um, uh, advanced technology. Um, that, Stu, did you have anything else to add to that about maintenance and upkeep? Uh, no, it depends. But the better job generally you do up front with more robust equipment may make for more expensive stations up front, the, least, the fewer costs you'll have down the road. Um, so uh, don't take any shortcuts, double up. And uh, yeah, generally stuff like that. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the questions on here. Stu provided the collaboration policy and fees, which is great. Um, Chris answered a question about solar. How reliable are solar relays arrays for units that don't have access to electric? Chris said solar works well, but in winter depends on snow cover and sun exposure. I have not um, waded into the realm of solar yet, but I'm going to have to soon. So, Stu, do you have anything else to add about the solar? Uh, just what I made in the comment there, and there's some material okay. on the website. Um, it's, and I'll just address the winter issue now. Typically the angle of the panel will keep the snow clear or just the sun will melt it off. Um, if you do wanna do a project in the winter, you kinda of have to integrate more frequent checks or doubling up the batteries um, just to ensure. Um, you, there's a number of issues in the winter at high latitude. You also have low sun angle and a lot of cloudy days. Um, so in winter, you're generally less reliable uh, and big batteries. Thank you, and thanks Chris and TJ for helping to answer that one. Um, those are all the questions I see in the chat. Um, I think we should start our lightning round where people chime in. Um, if you want to chime in, I know that like 30 to 40 
Um, 50% of people said that they had active modus projects or were hoping to do them in the next few years. If you could just say, write your name in the chat, uh, we can call on you um, and we can kind of go through that way. I think Jennifer um, with Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory was going to go first for us. Uh, maybe Nick Bailey can chime in after that. Before this, Xavier has a question um, and he says, will a tower pick up all tags as long as the frequency matches? Stu? Uh, as long as they're registered with MODIS, um, yeah, that's the key. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, Jennifer, do you want to go ahead and kick us off with the lightning round? Sure. Uh, so here in Wisconsin, I just want to give a quick update. We have four towers that are active right now in the kind of southern half of Wisconsin, and two more should be active this year. And then um, we're working on expanding it right now, working with ESTEM, environmental ed um, organizations, and trying to kind of leverage what Stu was talking about, leverage MODIS to get the most benefit out of it. And we're really just starting those partnerships now, but really enthusiastic about expanding that way. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's cool to see the educational components being worked on too, because it's just Migration in general, but MODIS especially, as I've said before, is just such a fascinating thing to present on. People get so excited about it. They, I love, everybody loves the collaborative nature of it. I think it really resonates with a lot of people. So thank you. Um, Nick, are you there? Do you want to give an update on what Selva is doing? Maybe he's not there. That's okay. I'll go to, uh, I'll go to Ariel. Do you want to go ahead? I know you typed it out, but. Um, yeah, so um, hi everybody, I'm Ariel Fernier. I'm at Forbes Biological Station with the Illinois Natural History Survey. And we put up four towers a couple weeks ago. The receivers aren't actually there yet, but the physical towers and the antennas are up um, along the Illinois River in central Illinois. We're looking at duck and uh, marsh bird movements. And we're hoping that if this goes well over the next year, we'll be deploying more towers across Illinois, and we'll make sure to plug in with the network to see how we can fit into that framework you put out, Sarah. So. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Yep. And I'll just join our steering committee to the Midwest Migration Network. So welcome. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Mike, uh, Wells, do you want to go ahead and speak to the group? I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention for a second. Um, oh, no. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> There's the the receiver question is a little bit of a um, a little bit of a wormhole. Uh, so sensor gnomes and CTT sensor stations can detect um, nano tags and CTT tags, um, but low tech receivers can only detect low tech tags. So that was an answer to a question that in the chat: Can any receiver capable of detecting a nano tag be integrated into the MODIS network? He says, "What about Sigma eight? Um, not currently, no. Um, we can talk about that offline. Again, it, it, I don't want to get into the weeds. Okay, that's fine. Um, Mike Wells from Fish and Wildlife Service says they're setting up six towers in the Mississippi Valley from St. Paul to Northern Illinois, tracking early migration of golden wing warblers. So that's awesome. Mike, if there's anything else you want to add to that, just chime in and interrupt me. Um, Mo Coral. Mo, do you want to go ahead from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Mo Corral. <clears throat> I'm new to this group, but um, and I'm actually here for Matt Webb, who is our MODIS coordinator at Bird Conservancy. Oh. He couldn't come today, but um, I just wanted to let everybody know about a fairly new um, collaborative partnership with Fish and Wildlife um, to start setting up a towers or excuse me stations i'm brand new to modus so i don't have all the vocab down <laughs> but um basically we've received funding from several sources to put up um stations across the great plains and chihuahuan desert um specifically to take a look at large-scale movements of grassland birds but also help um answer some smaller scale questions that we have as well. So that funding is coming from an NMBCA grant um, as well as science applications at Fish and Wildlife and NIFWIF and a couple other smaller sources. But um, we're starting a series of webinars to kind of identify the most important research questions for grassland birds and others in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. Um, and we're hoping to set up more stations within the next year or so. I think we've got 
funding for like 30 or so right now. But um, if anyone's interested in participating in those webinars and being part of this um, newer collaborative group, please let me know. I'll put my contact info in the chat box and uh, we can go from there. Thanks. Perfect. That's such a great update. Oh, asking for partners. Love it. Thank you, Mo. I appreciate it. Um, Nick. Nick was muted before. Nick, do you want to update folks on what Silva is up to with Modus? Sure. Uh, not too much to report, but um, we're still maintaining an array of towers down in Colombia and helping out with towers that are set up in Panama and Costa Rica. There are plans afoot to increase that array, so obviously it doesn't directly apply to the Midwest, but anybody hoping for detection south of the US, um, we're looking to greatly increase the coverage of, of towers in, in the coming years. Um, and this spring we sent a lot of birds north, hearing all these people saying their towers were down, they couldn't get to them, yeah. they feel like we probably missed out on an awful <laughs> lot of detections. Not that that was our primary question, but it would have been nice to, mm -hmm. to have a couple more of those fantastic gray cheek thrush-like examples of, of birds streaking north from, from Colombia. Um, and in terms of, you know, what we're working on with tagging species, Next year, there aren't actually any immediate plans. Um, I think like everyone, we're just feeling our way, seeing what's gonna happen, whether we can actually get into the field or not. Um, so nothing directly in the pipeline, but hopefully there will, there will be some, some plans to put for next spring. And the spring after, if we get that. And the spring after, <laughs> Fingers crossed, I like that picture. Okay, yeah. thank you, Nick, I appreciate that. Um, appreciate that update. Um, okay. Moving on to other questions. How close do towers need to be to accurately infer local movements? So anybody can chime in really here or Stu, if um, who you've done localized monitoring, uh, maybe Annie, uh, how far apart do you put your receivers? The classic modus answer is it depends. <laughs> um, so it depends on what antennas you're having and if you're doing manual tracking and what species. Um, so any tower can typically detect animals on the ground to uh, you know one or two kilometers if you're lucky um, when they're in the well it depends on the landscape but in a semi forested area and then the detection range increases dramatically when they're in flight um, so it depends um, but you know, I'd, I'd say a, a couple kilometers if you want that kind of scale if you want like tens or hundreds of meters um, there's other options that you can use by a dense array or CTP nodes um, are, uh, are new on the horizon that can give you a, a much more dense grid uh, of, uh, of stations and locations. Great, thank you. And since we keep talking about CTT, Dave, are you still there? Do you want to talk for a minute about CTT and the nodes kind of explain what those do locally and um, if you're there? Sure. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, sir. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so so the CTT sensor stations are kind of the stations we've been talking about, basically MODIS stations that can detect uh, both 434 megahertz tags, which are the tags that we're making, our life tags and power tags, as well as some GPS receivers, um, and then the 166 tags or any other uh, VHF frequency using a FunCube dongle or any other software defined radio like an RTL SDR. The nodes, as Sarah mentioned, are kind of mini base stations that can be added to a uh, an, to an area where you have a sensor station, and they can be set up in any way you want. But one of the kind of most straightforward ways to visualize is setting up in a grid, and you set these up in a grid at some distance of 100 meters, 200 meters apart, and then any birds that are any birds or any other animals that are tagged that end up in the gridded area then are getting picked up simultaneously at multiple nodes. And that simultaneous detection data can then be post-processed into localizations. So, you know, the holy grail with all these small animals is GPS. And so what we're really trying to do is kind of a quasi reverse GPS. But thinking about um, grids of nodes within the MODIS kind of uh, network is really kind of the next level of, of getting information. So we've seen these wonderful animations of kind of point to point straight distances. But imagine if, you know, I run a bird observatory here in Cape May for five years and we have a banding station here, and, you know, to think that a bird could come from somewhere else and then end up on our grid and spend several days in stopover and we actually can pinpoint what habitats that bird was using and how long it used it and then it leaves. 
that 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 magnitude of data that you kind of accrue via the radio and and um, that level of detail depth that you can get uh, really kind of enhances the modus network. Um, so yeah, so if you want to learn more about the nodes, you can come to celltracktech.com, our website, or you can email me at david.lapuma at celltracktech.com. And that's L-A-P-U-M as in Michael A. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, Chris Fox has a question. Although the focus of the presentations has been modus towers, has there been any standardized protocol for deployment of modus tags on migratory birds to reduce stress and potential negative impacts? especially on long distance migrants. This is kind of cool because it kind of overlaps with our band and ground survey uh, initiative within the mi Midwest Migration Network. Um, Stu, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, I can. There's, um, there's nothing that's been done uh, systematically to standardize it, um, besides from just a the field generally trying to minimize and publish techniques whenever possible. Um, and generally, mistakes and uh, reporting rates are underreported in publications, mm -hmm. um, but that's one thing to, to go with. There is a um, working document on the website called Tagging Things, and we've turned that into uh, standard operating procedures, which um, will probably be ready to release soon, which talk about um, the different harness techniques. Um, and so that just raised it up. Maybe by the end of summer, we'll have that available. Um, but I'll put a link in the chat to the current draft which is very drafty i'll just give it that caveat um, others there's a wealth of experience in tagging on this chat now so others may have um, something else to say okay great and yeah dave and Stu, or other folks who have spoken if you could leave your emails in the chat that would be great if, if people want to reach out to you uh, I know, Mo, you said you were going to do that. Okay, so Christina Davy says, or Davy, I'm sorry, with Trent University and Ontario uh, MNRF, we're using MODIS for bat tracking and trying to boost number of towers in empty parts of Ontario. I don't want to hear it, Ontario. There are no empty parts. I'm just kidding. Um, but Christina, do you want to speak to that at all? Hey, yay. Um, sure. Um, you're right, there are not as I'm many kidding. Here. <laughs> um, we're trying to fill in some of the spaces to the, it's kind of between the densely packed area in southwestern Ontario and over towards Ottawa area. Um, partly because we're hoping that that'll also help catch migrants coming down from James Bay that were tagged way up there on other projects, but our focus has been on bats and where we tried to set up an array um, using a number of different modus towers and we just found out about the CTT options. So we're really excited to explore them as well. But also like everybody else, our apologies that with pandemic life, we have not been able to keep our towers going well. So we're working on fixes for that too, hopefully soon. Nice, thank you very much. Go back up here. There's a lot of people doing a lot of modus stuff. This is awesome. Um, if there, I just want to say now before we're, you know, 15 minutes from the end, but if, if any of you are uh, interested in um, collaboration or you have collaboration opportunities, please email those to me. I will put my email in uh, the chat as well. Um, and we can kind of use that as a springboard. Um, if you want to be involved in future like email correspondence and things like that, um, also join the Midwest Migration Network online. Um, That'll help us keep in better touch with each other. And if you didn't have an opportunity to talk today, then I'm happy to um, um, to connect with you there. Okay. So Mike Wells, he was able to unable to unmute. I'm sorry. He said he's supposed to set up this year for the golden wing warbler tracking on spring migration, but coronavirus has delayed uh, them, like many of us, uh, hoping to get towers up this fall. That's great. Yeah, I just I just got released from unmute, but um, yeah, we're, we're the Fish and Wildlife Service has been really interested in in early migration and whether or not they're using the Minnesota, uh, Minnesota and Mississippi River valleys for um, for uh, essentially as a route for migration. So we're really interested in getting some information on that and if it's sort of having a funneling effect and in, in concentrating migrants. So we have six towers that we. We're supposed to set up um, and we have, uh, I think, 20 or so tags we're going to be putting on Golden Whirlers, supposedly 
right now, sadly, uh, we're not probably going to get those up till the fall, the, the earliest. So I have a pile of boxes in my cubicle right now that I'm being yelled at for occasionally. So I hear you. I have a variety of modus boxes sitting around my office. Yes, it takes up some space. Thank you, Michael. And Michael is a great uh, example. Uh, Michael was interested in this and he, you know, contacted uh, Amber and the Midwest Migration Network and he got on one of our calls and was able to talk about his project and we figured out ways to connect um, with the project because it was a modus uh, tagging project. So that was great and I encourage others to do so if you have these large scale projects or want to coordinate uh, tags across the region. Okay, who else? Xavier Tucson with the Land Between organization will be setting up two towers receivers in Ontario between the Georgian Bay and Ottawa Valley bioregions to track common night hawks and whippoorwills and other grass and birds, no longer head shikes and grasshopper sparrows. That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna start just reading some of these since there's a lot. If you all have extra things, just cut me off. Uh, Mo said, Northern Mexico and Southwestern US, we have existing collaborative partnerships with UANL and UJED in Durango, Nuevo Leon and Chihuahua. Um, Emily, says, happy to talk offline. Does anyone have experience using CTT nodes in conjunction with MODIS towers to track local movements? She listed her contact and Dave Lapuma, I think would be a good contact for that. Or Stu. Um, Vera Leopold, all right, she asked if Ariel could share her email and she did. Sorry, I'm just going along here. Um, uh, Allie Bird from Environmental Resilience Institute and Indiana University. We have three active stations here near Bloomington and have equipment to put up a fourth. We're deciding on the best location for that fourth station at this time. David, is there a current data processing system to get localizations or is that not developed in open access yet? Dave, are you still there? You want to chime in on that? Maybe he is away. Or muted. Um, Sorry, can you say who the, the name was again? I'm unmuting people. Yeah. Localizations in general is a um, a big a big ish issue or problem. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, with the nodes, it's a little bit more straightforward. Um, in other um, using the, the other telemetry, uh, Mike Ward and others have done a lot of work um, using triangulation, but it's not a simple, straightforward thing. Thanks for unmuting me, Sarah. So, um, yeah, the, the, I, I did reply in the in the chat, so okay. anyone who wants to look and see it. But basically, we we have a statistician on staff here who's worked up what he refers to as the zeroth order um, uh, analysis, which um, is in constant state of of improvement. So we have that that we can provide today, if um, if anybody's working. That we actually do provide it to anyone who's working with nodes currently, but um, definitely up for this becoming more of a kind of collaborative effort if there are folks that want to work on localization with node data. Um, there are other researchers. There are folks at Archibald Biological Station in Florida. Young Hasu's grad student at Cornell. She's working on a big node array up there and working with Bob, our, our statistician here, to come up with techniques that use uh, more information. There's a whole machine learning uh, approach that's being taken in, in some work in Staten Island right now at Columbia University. So there's definitely room for growth here, uh, but we do have a basic method that we've developed that um, under the right circumstances can provide very good, uh, accurate localization. So the answer is yes, uh, but we want, I'm hoping that there are folks on this call today that are really interested in pushing that forward. And, uh, and you can reach out to me. My uh, email is in the comments, in the chat. Well, cool. thank you, Dave. Thank you. Rob asks, is there any, Rob Deal asks, is there any effort to enable MODIS to function more broadly with data logging tags? For example, able to receive telemetry on temperature, pressure, altitude, or particular relevance to exposure to wind energy, et cetera. I'll hand that to Stu. Uh, yeah, at the current time, no, and it's, um, for the most part, it's up to the, the tech providers, uh, low tech and CTT as to whether, um, they can make those cat compatible. And I know a lot of the tags can do uh, pressure or altitude or that now. Um, transmitting that data through um, the receivers um, is another uh, is another issue because it's easier to do it with some receivers than others. You can't necessarily do it across um, 
across the board. Um, but it's probably best to start talking with the tech providers if you have immediate interest in that. And it's definitely something Modus as a whole is paying attention to and um, would like to uh, integrate. Okay, David has his hand up. Stephanie has to unmute folks. Thank you, Stephanie, for doing that. <laughs> Thank you, you, Stephanie. I just remembered the raised hand thing. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so Stu makes a, a, the perfect point. So we are currently making, we have transmitters now that go on larger animals. It's our ES200. It's a GPS logger that sends data over that 434 megahertz frequency. So um, we have owls in Tasmania right now that are sending data to MODIS stations. Uh, we are, it is not going to MODIS, it's not going to import it to MODIS, but as I mentioned in the chat, you know, data is data. So, so we've got, you know, we're building tiny transmitters uh, soon with altimeters, eventually with GPS is at the, at the kind of the, the small bird size transmitter and all of that can go through their stations. So if it can go through our stations, as long as we build the connection to MODIS, it can go to MODIS. So like I said in my comment, I don't want to put the cart before the horse because that last part of making that connection is always a challenge and it takes a lot of uh, resources, but I'm sure working with Birds Canada and Stuart folks, we can, we can find a way to do that. Cool. Thank you, Dave. Okay, I think one last comment is from Andrew Rothman. Hi, Andrew. Um, he mentioned, I did mention the tower in Nicaragua, which is great. Um, we helped put up a tower at El Jaguar uh, Reserve down there. Um, but I also want to mention that ABC put out 10 modus tags on 10 wood thrush and 10 on Louisiana water thrush in January, this last January in Nicaragua, um, near the El Jaguar Reserve. So thanks to funds from the state of Pennsylvania through Southern Wings. Um, so uh, Southern Wings has been a great outlet for a lot of states to give money to habitat work and also uh, research down on uh, stopover sites in the wintering grounds. And we, we used our Heritage Foundation funds and Southern Wings funds to help support a lot of good projects ABC is doing uh, on those stopover sites in the wintering grounds and also Selva with Nick Bailey. Um, working with projects down there. So um, if you're from a state agency, I really encourage you to look into Southern Wings if you don't already know about it and try to contribute to that. Okay. I don't think, um, I don't think that we have a whole lot more. I don't know that we have a lot of time for discussion and new ideas. If anybody has a burning topic that they're thinking of planning uh, a MODIS project in the next few years that they would like to uh, coordinate regionally, please, you can chime in now and interrupt me. It's hard though, I think that you can unmute yourself, but please put in the, um, in the chat box, if you have those ideas, email me at sarah.kendrick at mdc.mo.gov. Um, Stu says, don't be shy. Uh, Stu has always been probably the most approachable person uh, in charge of one of these huge, huge groups. Uh, so has Dave, who's been really responsive. And so do not hesitate to reach out to those folks. Uh, the one thing that I love so much about MODIS and working internationally with bird conservation groups is we all have this feeling of we're all in this together. We want to learn about um, these shared birds that we share between countries and, uh, and across our state lines. And so I really encourage you guys to reach out to others if you have ideas for tagging or putting up receivers. Uh, everybody's here to help, especially with MODIS. Um, I have one more reminder. Um, thanks for joining everyone. Um, Stephanie posted this. Thank you to Stephanie for helping to drive us in the background. I really appreciate your help. Um, so yeah, just echoing what she said. Thanks so much for attending today, for taking the time. Um, we have uh, two more sessions tomorrow. Uh, the AM one begins at 1030 Eastern, 930 Central. It'll focus on radar and acoustics. You can use the same Zoom, Zoom link to join. Uh, and then we'll have a closing session where we kind of wrap up all of these different initiative uh, discussions. So please chime into that. And we have a keynote speaker, Fabiola Rodriguez. Um, and we'll have a panel discussion with, with me. Oh boy. So thank you guys, everyone, for chiming in with your efforts um, um, and letting us know what you're doing. And we hope to be in touch uh, in the future. Please don't be shy. Thanks. <laughs>